Hi there and welcome. This is Book of Mormon Reader and I do thank you so much for joining me today on this beautiful day. It has a special meaning for me this day and I am constantly marveling at the little blessings that the Lord showers upon me because I've been doing this project and I'll explain that a little bit more when I explain who I'm dedicating my chapter to today. I want to explain too if this is your very first time that you are listening that I, Book of Mormon reader, have been reading the Book of Mormon publicly for several years and to mix things up a little bit I decided to read it backwards this time. So I'm going from Moroni backwards through Nephi and we're on 3rd Nephi chapter 11 today and this is like the crescendo of the Book of Mormon that everything before 3rd Nephi 11 is leading up to this moment and everything after is the result of what happens and what we're going to read today. So it's very, I think this is maybe the, the pinnacle most exciting and most <laughs> miraculous. Miraculous is an understatement. Just a really critical chapter. So let's get to it, shall we? And then we can talk about it. The Book of Mormon, 3rd Nephi, chapter 11. And now it came to pass that there were a great multitude gathered together of the people of Nephi round about the temple which was in the land bountiful. And they were marveling and wondering one with another, and were showing one to another the great and marvelous change which had taken place. And they were also conversing about this Jesus Christ, of whom the sign had been given concerning his death. And it came to pass that while they were thus conversing one with another, they heard a voice as if it came out of heaven, and they cast their eyes round about. They understood not the voice which they heard. And it was not a harsh voice, neither was it a loud voice. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding it being a small voice, it did pierce them that did hear to the center, insomuch that there was no part of their frame that it did not cause to quake. Yea, it did pierce them to the very soul, and did cause their hearts to burn. And it came to pass that again they heard the voice, and they understood it not. And again the third time they did hear the voice, and did open their ears to hear it, and their eyes were towards the sound thereof, and they did look steadfastly towards heaven, from whence the sound came. And behold, the third time they did understand the voice which they heard, and it said unto them, Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name. Hear ye him. And it came to pass, as they understood, they cast their eyes up again towards heaven. And behold, they saw a man descending out of heaven, and he was clothed in a white robe. And he came down and stood in the midst of them. And the eyes of the whole multitude were turned upon him, and they durst not open their mouths even one to another, and wist not what it meant, for they thought it was an angel that had appeared unto them. And it came to pass that he stretched forth his hand and spake unto the people, saying, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. And behold, I am the light and the life of the world. And I have drunk out of that bitter cup which the Father hath given me, and have glorified the Father in taking upon me the sins of the world, in the which I have suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. And it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, the whole multitude fell to the earth, for they remembered that it had been prophesied among them that Christ should show himself unto them after his ascension into heaven. And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto them, saying, Arise! And come forth unto me, that ye may thrust your hands into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel, and the God of the whole earth, and have been slain for the sins of the world. And it came to pass that the multitude went forth, 
and thrust their hands into his side, and did feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet, and this they did do, going forth one by one, until they had all gone forth, and did see with their eyes, and did feel with their hands, and did know of a surety, and did bear record, that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. And when they had all gone forth, and had witnessed for themselves, they did cry out with one accord, saying, Hosanna! Blessed be the name of the Most High God! And they did fall down at the feet of Jesus, and did worship him. And it came to pass that he spake unto Nephi, for Nephi was among the multitude, and he commanded him that he should come forth. And Nephi arose and went forth, and bowed himself before the Lord, and did kiss his feet. And the Lord commanded him that he should arise, and he arose and stood before him. And the Lord said unto him, I give unto you power that ye shall baptize this people when I am again ascended into heaven. And again the Lord called others, and said unto them likewise. And he gave unto them power to baptize. And he said unto them, On this wise ye shall baptize, and there shall be no disputations among you. Verily I say unto you, that whoso repenteth of his sins through your words, and desireth to be baptized in my name, on this wise shall ye baptize them. Behold, ye shall go down and stand in the water, and in my name shall ye baptize them. And now, behold, these are the words which ye shall say, calling them by name, saying, Having authority given me of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And then shall ye immerse them in the water, and come forth again out of the water. And after this manner shall ye baptize in my name, for behold, Verily I say unto you, that the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one, and I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and the Father and I are one. And according as I have commanded you, thus shall ye baptize. And there shall be no disputations among you, as there have hitherto been. Neither shall there be disputations among you concerning the points of my doctrine, as there have hitherto been. For verily, verily, I say unto you, He that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil, who is the father of contention. And he stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger one with another. Behold, this is not my doctrine, to stir up the hearts of men with anger one against another. But this is my doctrine, that such things should be done away. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, I will declare unto you my doctrine. And this is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine which the Father hath given unto me. And I bear record of the Father, and the Father beareth record of me. And the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father and to me, and I bear record that the Father commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. And whoso believeth in me, and is baptized, the same shall be saved, and they are they who shall inherit the kingdom of God. And whoso believeth not in me, and is not baptized, shall be damned. Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine, and I bear record of it from the Father. And whoso believeth in me, believeth in the Father also, and unto him will the Father bear record of me, for he will visit him with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And thus will the Father bear record of me, and the Holy Ghost will bear record unto him of the Father and me. For the Father and I and the Holy Ghost are one. And again I say unto you, ye must repent, and become as a little child, and be baptized in my name, or ye can in no wise receive these things. And again I say unto you, ye must repent, and be baptized in my name, and become as a little child, or ye can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
that this is my doctrine, and whoso buildeth upon this, buildeth upon my rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. And whoso shall declare more or less than this, and establish it for my doctrine, the same cometh of evil, and is not built upon my rock. But he buildeth upon a sandy foundation, and the gates of hell stand open to receive such, when the floods come, and the winds beat upon them. Therefore go forth unto this people, and declare the words which I have spoken unto the ends of the earth. Wow. <laughs> this is a wow chapter. When I think about that word wow, I, I know when I'm making videos for YouTube, there's one of the little editing tools that I can do is, is called wow. And whatever you put in the text, it pops up on the video like it's a, a red cloud. Wow. Like something Batman would say, Shazam or boink or however he does it so this is a wow and when i think about wow moments and i think about what has happened to these people and the confusion that they have just endured before this point comes i did peek a little bit back into the chapter just before this and they have just experienced an incredible scary scary thing where all the wicked people have been swallowed up and burned and taken with smoke and vapors. But here they are. They're still here. And so they're, they're talking about it and they, they hear this voice and it's, it's coming from heaven. And yet they can't really hear it. And I think there's so many noises and things that are competing for our attention today that the principle that's in here for us today is that, my goodness, if you would like to hear the Holy Ghost whispering to you, if you would like to hear messages from heaven, if you would like to receive personal inspiration from God through the Holy Ghost, then you have to put forth the effort and be quiet and be still and quiet the noises in your head and all the things that compete for your attention, for my attention. The computer, the television, activities, everything that we go throughout the day doing, that it's noise and it's prohibiting us from having that free flow of communication that we could be having by just taking a moment to still ourselves. And so when you think, oh, I'm doing nothing, I'm not being productive, actually doing nothing may be the most productive thing that you can do when you consider things in this life that are essential. And things that are essential are things that will help us to understand and return back to our Heavenly Father. So really, it makes sense to take time out and meditate. It's different than reading scriptures, which is also important. It's different than praying, which is also important. But meditating is that time when if we have prayed, that's one good thing, but that's a one-way conversation. And now the meditating part is the part where the Lord can answer you. He can answer you. And receiving inspiration, receiving guidance, receiving. So here it is. They're, they can't quite hear it. And so then they're like, wait a second, did you, did you hear that? In fact, I remember the scene from that. I think it was on Ghostbuster. He goes, listen, did you smell something? <laughs> I mean, it's not funny. You could smell a sound. So, but here he says, they looked in that direction so they could see, they wanted to see the voice. And that's important too when you think about noises and it helps to engage as many of our senses as we possibly can to get the full grasp of what's happening here. And so finally they hear it. Then they see this incredible being come from heaven. Now, why do you think this is 
the moment in the Book of Mormon that so many missionaries share with converts. That what? The Lord visited? The Lord visited people in the Americas? What? This is incredible. And so, yes, it is incredible. And so think of all the things that were dispelled as far as disputations by having the heavens be open again. Then further clarification, he says, touch me. That's one of the first things he does. First of all, he says who he is because they think it's an angel. And he says, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. So then he validates the prophet's words. And these people were spared, as we'll find out tomorrow, because they did not, they did listen to the prophets and they didn't stone the prophets, but they listened to them and they heeded their words. They were not yet members of his church, but they were open to the prophecies. Their hearts were opened. And he says, I am the light and the life of the world. Words he has used since he was Jehovah. And he says, I have drunk out of that bitter cup which the Father hath given me. I, I, one thing that I, I did want to share, which was incredible, is the fact that there's two things here when he talks about, I have drunk out of that bitter cup which the Father hath given me, and the fact that he lets them touch him. And I want to read this quote from Jeffrey R. Holland. He says, The wounds in his hands, feet, and side are signs that in mortality painful things happen, even to the pure and the perfect. Signs that tribulation is not evidence that God does not love us. It is a significant and hopeful fact that it is the wounded Christ who comes to our rescue. He who bears the scars of sacrifice, the lesions of love, the emblems of humility and forgiveness is the captain of our soul. The evidence of pain and mortality is undoubtedly intended to give courage to others who are also hurt and wounded by life, perhaps even in the house of their friends. In spite of the size of the great multitude, Christ nevertheless took time for each one to have that personal experience. This is incredible. So then he says in verse 15 that the multitude went forth. And as referenced by that quote, one by one. And that's significant too, because some people in today's day, they talk about collective salvation. That is not how salvation is granted. Salvation is granted on a personal and intimate basis. And he says that right here. They went forth one by one. Nobody was left out. So then it was thousands, thousands who had this experience feeling him. And so what did they learn about resurrection? They learned that it's a body, that you can touch it, that you can squeeze it and feel it and put your fingers. And that's significant because a lot of people think that this mystery of this, this Godhead, that there's some disembodied being, which is not the case. He's saying right here, I am giving you firsthand. You don't have to take it from somebody else. You will know firsthand that a resurrected body is a reuniting of the body and the spirit. And here I am, and you can see for yourself. That's incredibly significant. So then they have these words, the incredible moment of humility when they say, Hosanna, and they fell down at the feet of Jesus and did worship him. I cannot imagine being in the presence of, of God and not falling down on, I mean, just because you're so, you know, just the fact that you realize what is happening, that you're actually there to witness this. And remember, the Book of Mormon is written for our day, which means this is going to happen for us. We know the second coming is, is, is imminent. The signs and the times are pointing the way that this will happen in our lifetime. Indeed, I know for me personally, in my patriarchal blessing, it says that I will see the Savior. That's what it says. I will see the Savior. That this is the generation for this great event. So sometime in my lifetime, I'm going to experience this. I will fall at the feet of the Savior. 
as they did here. This is an incredible, incredible chapter. So then, after he, this is the, this is the other thing that's amazing. What, what's the first thing he wants to say after they all have this one-on-one -on -one experience with him? And then he talks about baptizing. And he says, first of all, I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you the authority to baptize. And he tells him how to do it. He tells him what to say. And he says, this is because there have been disputations. And he mentions that several times. He said, you know, there's still some confusion and there, I don't want there to be confusion. So let me be clear. That's what he's saying there. I don't want any confusion about this. He says what to say. He says, you know, you having authority given me of Jesus Christ. And one of the things I read about this had a little like in today's day, we say having been commissioned of Jesus Christ. And so they speculate that they say having authority given me of Jesus Christ because he was actually there and he actually bestowed upon him right there. And so that's incredible. And then he says, you shall immerse them in the water and come forth again out of the water. Now, the other nine, I went to Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels in Los Angeles. And in the back of this cathedral, they had a, a font there with holy water in it. And on the wall behind it, there was this enormous tapestry of, it looked like it was Jesus being baptized. And yet it was, it was I thought, how could somebody come up who was commissioned to paint a picture of this baptism when clearly he was baptized of John the Baptist in the River Jordan. Then the, the dove descended on him. But here this picture was somebody kneeling down, or if it wasn't Jesus, it sure looked like him, in front of somebody and they had a pot of water and they were pouring it over his head. I thought, how do you get that? <laughs> how, how do you get that over? He says here. And so still there are disputations. And so one of the great things about the Book of Mormon is that he clarifies some of these doctrines that have been confusing, evidently, to people clear back since his day, and it continues to this day. And then when he talks about disputations, he talks about contention. And this is a huge thing, and I thought that this quote was pointing to say about contention. And this is about, I think, sometimes even people who have the truth revel in contention. And we have, everywhere you turn on, on television or, or news or whatever, they eat it up. They love the contention. They love the sparring. They love the repartee that happens between opposing views. And last night we had the State of the Union, and then there were a couple of responses to it. And, you know, the media just eats it up. They love the contention. But listen to what George Buchanan said about the contention. My brethren and sisters, above all things, therefore, we should seek for this spirit of union and love. It should be sought for in our councils, and we should not contend. Now suppose that I should take it into my head and say that a certain doctrine is true, and I contend for it, determined to have it so. Does my contention make it true? Suppose that I should contend from now until the Savior came that it is true. Would my contention make it true? Certainly not. I cannot change a principle of truth. Then why contend or dispute or argue about it? There can be no change wrought in doctrine and in truth by our contention. But I will tell you where there is room for differences of opinion in regard to the policy to be pursued. There ought to be no contention, however. God speaks against it. We have no right to be a disputing, contentious people. And whenever I dispute with my brother, I am likely to grieve the Spirit of the Lord and darken my own mind. Therefore, let us avoid contention in our councils and in all our intercourse one with another. And I would add in our Sunday school classes, in our online threads, in our Facebook pages, I would add all of those things because people really, I mean, believe me, I've seen it. Then this other part about being clear about the doctrine. The Savior was clear and distinct about his doctrine. They're so pure and fundamental that they have must have been a part of the plan of salvation as scripted in the councils of heaven. And so after one accepts that God exists, which now they know they've touched him, the most fundamental doctrine is that all men must repent, 
believe in Christ and be baptized in order to be saved, whereas those who do not believe and are not baptized shall be damned. If it sounds too simple, it's not. If it sounds too harsh, it's not. It is the truth and the key to salvation. Therefore, the role of the Latter-day Servant is to limit the number of souls living or dead who will be damned because of their unbelief and unwillingness to be baptized now we as members of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints every one of us has been declared a missionary because we seek to what they said here quote limit those who will be damned we want to share this gospel of peace and if people don't accept it we can't do anything about that but I think it's significant that he says, please stop fighting about it. Don't fight about it. Let's be one. Let's have union here. This is an incredible, incredible chapter. And so I want to, for just a quick second here, I want to say who I'm dedicating this chapter to. When I finished reading this and I saw in my mind, wow, I flipped it upside down and I thought, mom. And when I became a mom 23 years ago today, my first time, I was a stepmother before that, but I became a mother of my own daughter 23 years ago, and she's turned 23 today, and I was 23 when I had her. And so our lives intersected for the first time on that, that morning, 23 years ago at 7.13 in the morning. And I am telling you, when I was reading this chapter and I thought, he says to become as a little child and this this being coming from heaven, I that's what I saw, my little daughter coming from heaven. And the wonderment and the marvel in my heart and in my, my eyes, my hands, and that I wanted to examine every part of her. I looked at her fingers, I looked at her toes, I looked at her where her belly button would be after they cut the umbilical cord and I witnessed for myself as these people did by touching the Savior this miracle this absolute miracle and so my daughter is who I'm dedicating this chapter to today and this is her birthday today February 13th 2013 and that is where my heart is today and so I'm grateful for the opportunity that I had to share this with you and I hope that you appreciate it, enjoy it and share it and we'll see you next time for 3rd Nephi chapter 10. <laughs>